I'm Michelle Ackley. My parents both grew up on council estates, and as a family, we understand the difference social housing can make to people's lives. Millions of families across the UK are struggling to find affordable housing. So this is my front room and my bedroom together. Many are living in temporary or overcrowded conditions, desperate for somewhere decent to live. This is our room where we sleep, and this is what we've got at the minute. We can't really call it our home. But some social housing tenants are abusing the system, holding on to properties they no longer need. When somebody applies for housing, you expect them to live in a property, and when they don't, it does start to take the mickey. Or even worse, making a small fortune by illegally subletting them. He was charging beyond £1,500 a month. He exploited this completely to his advantage. So I'm with housing investigators cracking down on tenancy cheats. What a waste. If you want to commit tenancy fraud, don't bother coming here. Reclaiming properties. I need to uh, speak to you, please. They've seen an opportunity and they think they're not going to get caught. And giving them to families in genuine need. That's how a council house should be. It should be loved and looked after. This is Council House Crackdown. Today, the fake council cleaner who over 14 years brazenly swindled hundreds of thousands of pounds from the public purse. You'd think she'd want to steer away from the council rather than be working within the building. Exactly. Investigators unravel an illegal subletter's lies. There you can see a handbag there, um, girls' pyjamas, because there was nothing in that flat belonging to Mr Raji. Nothing at all revealing an astonishing double life. This is an individual who's mixing with premiership footballers, who's, you know, got a very well-paid job. The arrogance of that, really, is, is the galling part. And subtenants help a fraud team bring down an illegal landlord. Yeah, we're home now, so if you want, you can come around. I need to uh, speak to you, please. Can you open the door, please, sir? Social housing is intended to go to those most in need. It provides struggling families and individuals with a stable home at a subsidised rent well below the market value. But for unscrupulous social tenants, subletting their home and charging at or near the normal market rate provides a lucrative but unlawful income. Our first case involves this man. Adio Raji, a fully qualified goalkeeping coach, working at some of London's top football clubs and leading a lifestyle that would be the envy of any football fan. This is an individual who's mixing with premiership footballers, who's, you know, got a very well-paid job and making a profit out of this flat. You know, the arrogance of that, really, is, is the galling part. It all started here, in this block of flats, right next door to Charlton Athletic Football Club in South East London. Back in 1995, Mr Raji, a single young man who enjoyed his football and was in need of housing, was allocated a flat on the 12th floor. To Greenwich counter fraud manager Nigel Brown and his colleagues, this tenancy seemed like a perfect match. As you can see, we're right next to and overlooking the Charlton football ground. This is a really desirable place to live. And this is where Mr Raji had his one-bedroom flat. Now, if you are into your football and you are really close to the ground, you wouldn't even need to pay for a ticket. Although Mr Raji's flat was social housing, it was owned and run not by Greenwich Council, but by housing association Charlton Triangle. There are over 4 million social housing properties in the UK. More than half of those, 2.3 million, are owned and run by housing associations. The rest are council properties. Charlton Triangle rent officer Annette Alrimple and Ford investigator Yasmin Odenoy pride themselves in getting to know their tenants and supporting them through difficult times. One of their favourite tenants was none other than Mr Raji. We, he used to come into the office and used to, you know, laugh and joke with him. And everybody got to know him and we all liked him. I mean, he, he had rent arrears. We were trying to sustain the tenancy. 
one of the ways of doing that is helping people get into employment. So that was one of the main mm. things we helped him to do. But I would say everybody knew him. He was quite a charismatic yes. person, I suppose. Mm. Mr Raji eventually got work as a UEFA qualified goalkeeping coach. And during the time he was living in the flat, he worked at several top football clubs, as well as doing jobs such as chauffeuring to top up his income. Then, in June 2015, fraud investigator Yasmin got a tip-off email from Charlton Triangle's building services team, telling her there appeared to be two women living in Mr Raji's one-bedroom flat. Knowing Mr Raji as they did, they were surprised by the information. And we were like, no, it's a mistake, something's wrong. Myself and Annette went down to the property. Uh, we got to the door and there was a young lady coming out of the lift. We asked if she lived in the property, she said yes. Having been let into the flat, they had a good look around. We took some photographs and as you can see, this is um, a girl's bedroom. Um, mauve and pink colours were all around the room. There was flowers there. Um, there you can see a handbag there, um, girls' pyjamas. There wasn't so much as a pair of football boots to suggest Mr Raji was living there. And um, this is the other end of the room. Mr Raji's six foot four with no hair at all. Um, so there'd be no reason for him to have a hairdryer. It was starting to look as if Mr Raji had moved out of his social housing property and two young women had moved in. This is supposed to be the front room but had a double bed in it. Again, women's things. There was no uh, men's products around, um, their makeup, creams. Actually, when I saw this, I did have to laugh. It was quite clear cut he was subletting to these young ladies. Because there was nothing in that flat belonging to Mr. Raju. Nothing at all. The woman at the flat gave them a witness statement there and then saying she and the other subtenants were paying Mr. Raji a total of £800 a month in rent, nearly twice the social rent Mr. Raji was paying Charlton Triangle. She said she'd been staying there for the last 12 months. They would pay into his bank account. Um, then he stopped that and said that he wanted cash only. And they said on the 6th of every month, he would come up to the flat and take the cash from them and apparently he had a key and he would let himself in as well. So he would just turn up and walk into the flat. Yasmin and Annette were shocked. If the claims of the subtenant were true, their tenant, Mr. Raji, was guilty of tenancy fraud. One of those um, situations where you scratch your head in disbelief, you think, no, not Mr. Raji. Can't be. But uh, yes, it was. They invited him to come into the office for an interview. He denied subletting his one-bedroom flat, claiming the woman was an ex-partner who was staying there rent-free. And we kind of like, well, where do you sleep then? And he's, he said the hallway. He said he, he slept in the hallway. hallway. We got him to sign some paperwork saying that he that was his only home, his only principal home, that he was not living anywhere else. But his story didn't ring true. He said that we were his friends. Yes. <laughs> That's the bit that made me laugh. <laughs> that, you know, we were his best friends almost and that he wouldn't do anything to hurt us. With Mr Raji denying everything, Yasmin and Annette needed hard evidence. So they called in the Royal Borough of Greenwich fraud team, led by experienced investigator Karen Evans. I've dealt with a lot of sublets. Um, and often uh, people will deny that they're subletting. We don't expect them to do anything else. Often they've been doing it for many years and making a lot of money from it. So they're going to try and cover their tracks. My job is to you know, undo what they're telling me, to find out what is the truth, to obtain the evidence to prove that and get them into court and hopefully get the conviction at the end of the day. The Prevention of Social Housing Tenancy Fraud Act 2013 makes unauthorised subletting a criminal offence, punishable by up to two years in jail or a fine of up to £50,000. 
Councils have been given new powers to access personal data such as bank accounts in order to help them secure evidence of tenancy fraud and prosecute those responsible. Later, as Greenwich Council used these new powers to unravel Mr. Raji's deception, he reveals his true colours. He was lying from the beginning. He was blaming somebody else for, for what he was doing wrong. We couldn't believe that, that, that Mr. Raji would behave in that manner. Shocking and upsetting and disappointing, to say the least. There are more than 200,000 social housing properties across the West Midlands. That's 5% of the UK's entire social housing stock. But even so, the pressure on housing here is huge, and Birmingham has embarked on a programme to build 2,000 more council properties by 2020. In Sandwell, six miles outside Birmingham, there are around 4,000 people on the housing waiting list, many in overcrowded or emergency accommodation. Our next case involves this woman, Yvette Logan, real name Lillian Wade. She shouldn't even be in the UK, but for the last 14 years, she's been living in a council flat in Sandwell, claiming almost £100,000 in benefits and even getting herself a job at the local council. So let me get this straight. She had a council property in the name of Yvette Logan, passports in the name of Yvette Logan, and was working for the council in the name of Yvette Logan. I find it absolutely shocking. The story starts here at Gatwick Airport, where Lillian Wade arrived from Jamaica in 1999. She was refused entry but granted temporary admission for just half a day, on the condition she flew back the next morning. But she absconded, and it was to take another 14 years before anyone caught up with her. I'm in Sandwell to see the council's counter fraud manager, Oliver Knight. So when she came to us, she'd been in the country for about a year before she approached the council. She explained that she was a single person and in need of accommodation. And so what was her application like? It didn't have any alarm bells or anything that you thought? No, there was nothing untoward, nothing that, that really looked like anything was suspicious. By now, Lillian Wade had a whole new identity. She called herself Yvette Logan. Aged 55, she had a UK passport in that name and a national insurance number, also in that name. Her housing application was successful. As a single woman in need of somewhere to live, she was allocated a council flat. But her next move was even more brazen. As well as, as applying for a council property, she also came to us in about 2000 and applied for a job and was given a position as a cleaner and worked there for about four or five years. So let me get this straight. She had a council property in the name of Yvette Logan, passports in the name of Yvette Logan, and was working for the council in the name of Yvette Logan. I find it absolutely shocking that, you know, the, the, just the cheek of it. How did she get away with it? In all honesty, I don't know, um, even to this day. Obviously, the passport was the trigger and, and the, the identification behind that. And obviously, once she's got that, it makes it a lot easier to, to get through the checks that we will have in place. You'd think she'd want to steer away from the council rather than be working within the building. Exactly. You, you wouldn't have thought for a second that her ideal placement for work would have been right under the noses of the council. And what do your colleagues at Sandwell Council think about this? Well, obviously, it was amazing at the time when we began the investigation, we thought it was just about the council property. It was only when we started to look at who she was that we realised she'd actually been employed by us as well. In 2005, Yvette Logan resigned from her cleaning job at the council on medical grounds and started claiming benefits. She received housing benefit and council tax benefit, as well as other benefits. Effectively, the council then began to pay her rent for and she was living rent for her. How much money, roughly in total, did this amount to? In total, she, she received about £30,000 of benefits, housing benefit and council tax benefit. She also claimed benefits from the Department of Work and Pensions, including incapacity benefit, income support, employment and support allowance, and disability living allowance. Grand total, nearly £100,000. 
Then in 2013, after a routine data matching exercise, authorities noticed a vet Logan was using someone else's national insurance number, and that someone else was also called a vet Logan. And that's when it became clear through the DWP that there, weren't, there wasn't one Yvette Logan, there were two with the same national insurance number. It appeared that what you've been doing is using the national insurance number of a, a, a different Yvette Logan elsewhere in the country. The real Yvette Logan was living in London and was completely unaware her details were being used by someone else. At first, the authorities assumed there'd been a mix-up and issued a vet Logan, the one living in Sandwell, with a new national insurance number. But behind the scenes, suspicions had been aroused and an investigation was launched. How did it eventually get to the point where she came under investigation? Well, in 2014, she was arrested by the work, Department of Work and Pensions along with the police um, following an investigation that they'd been conducting, the fact that she got an identity that they didn't believe to be correct. And obviously, we then looked at the housing application and thought, well, this isn't right. She should never have been given the housing application because the information she supplied wasn't correct. And I guess it just goes to show that you can't rule anything out because people go to extraordinary lengths to get these properties and, and literally slip through the net. With so many people desperate for social housing, local councils across the UK now have much more rigorous processes in place to ensure social housing goes to people who really need it and who are eligible for it. We do, do a lot more in terms of application checkers now. We try to bet, especially anybody coming in from a different country, we've got better systems in place to, to look at the, the application and the, the documentation that they're providing, um, as well as a lot more data matching. So ensuring that the information that's held with the likes of the passport agency and the immigration is up to date. On February the 24th, 2015, Yvette Logan appeared before Wolverhampton Crown Court under her real name, Lillian Wade. She admitted gaining a pecuniary advantage by deception by falsely representing she was a British citizen entitled to work in the UK and cheating the public revenue. She also admitted being in possession of a false identity document with intent. Lillian Wade, a.k.a. Yvette Logan, was sentenced to four years in jail. When released, she will be deported. I can imagine when the news came through, you must have felt like punch in the air. Yeah, well, obviously, it was, it was, a, good, it was a good decision for us and, and for the Department of Work and Pensions, who, who led the prosecution. Um, and it was only that, at that point that she surrendered the tenancy to us. In fact, it, 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 funny enough, she, she actually phoned us um, from uh, prison to indicate that she'd returned the property, keys, and the um, post them through the letterbox. And obviously, the you know the fake Yvette Logan is no longer in this property. Is, is someone in it now that actually genuinely needs it? There, there is, yeah. We, uh, following the fact that we, we got the property back, obviously it, it was it was cleaned up and it was it was reallocated to somebody that needed it, and they've lived in the property since. The London borough of Tower Hamlets, with soaring property prices, around 20,000 people on the waiting list for social housing, and more than 80 families with children registered as homeless. But 600 properties have been lost here through right to buy applications in the last five years. Most of my friends are moving out because of the crisis of the houses local, especially in this area, Tower Hamlets. We definitely need more council and social housing, without a shadow of a doubt. I think the whole idea that everybody can afford to get on the property ladder is nonsense now. But I don't know how you do anything about that because most of the places that were council houses have been sold off. The housing crisis is hitting hard, so it's inevitable that every time someone cheats the system by holding onto a property they don't need or by unlawfully subletting it, someone else loses out. Our next case spans two years and involves this young couple who became innocent victims caught up in a tenancy fraud case involving this man, Kibria Ahmed. 
I was really upset. I mean, it was horrible. It felt like everything was perfect and then it's just been taken away. The story begins here, in Tower Hamlets, where in October 2015, this young couple, Shannon and her boyfriend Naeem, were looking to build a home together. We had a look on Gumtree and we found this flat and it seemed perfect for what we wanted. We yeah, nice. arranged to meet up with the landlords. We sort of, we viewed it and everything seemed okay. He seemed legit. And then, yeah, we sort of, we sort of moved in the following week, didn't we? The rent for the one bedroom flat was 800 pounds per month, plus a 600 pound deposit. They'd been saving up and could just about afford it. So we used to be in uh, sharing flats before sharing houses and be in the rooms and someone else there. But that was only our place, there's no one there. And it looks like it's our home. As soon as they moved in, Shannon and Naeem set about turning their flat into a home. It was just great getting things for the house. It, was, it felt really good, it felt like home. I loved coming home from work and stuff like that. It was brilliant, you know? It was yeah, just... it was nice. Like, having a new home. You, Happy to call someone, to invite someone to come around. Yeah, it's proud. It's that was good. Like, it's our house. But unbeknown to Shannon and Naeem, their new home was not a private flat. It was social housing. And the tenant, Kabria Ahmed, the man who was supposed to be living there, was unlawfully subletting it. Mr Ahmed was allocated the flat back in 2008 by housing association Poplar Harker. Following a tip-off that Mr. Ahmed wasn't living there, Poplar Harker's fraud investigator, Avril Drummond, decided to investigate. On the 3rd of December, 2015, she called round to the flat, hoping to see Mr. Ahmed, but instead finding Shannon and Naeem. There was a police officer and there was this lady, and I thought, well, what's happened? Like, maybe something's happened. And she sort of said, like, with a, I'm the proper landlord, and I was, I was a bit like, no, no, you're not. So she showed me her ID, and I was like, okay, maybe you better come in. And... Avril broke the news to them that the flat was being unlawfully sublet. Shannon and Naeem were devastated. I was really upset. I mean, it was horrible. It felt like everything was perfect, and then it's just been taken away. Like, mm -hmm. how can someone do that to, to innocent people? Like, it really hurt. I mean, having a house, finally living on my own with the person I really want to be with, and then everything's taken away. Avril needed to come face to face with her unlawful tenant, so she enlisted the help of Shannon and Naeem. She came up with a plan to ask the landlord around to fix a blocked sink. Our cameras were filming with Avril and her team when this plan came to fruition on the 9th of December, 2015. The best scenario would be for, um, you know, the, this landlord to tell us everything that um, has been going on, hold his hands up, then we'll take it from there. Once round at the flat, Avril gives Shannon and Naeem a last minute briefing. Hello. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you for seeing me again today. Obviously, we're now waiting for your landlord to turn up, OK? So we'll just play it by ear when he gets here. We've got the police on standby, and they're in the locality as well, OK? Naeem calls the man who's posing as his landlord and checks he's on his way. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, we're home now, so if you want, you can come around, cos maybe after. All right, thanks, bye. Next few minutes. The man in question is about to arrive. I'm going to be in here. Yeah, he's not going to know who I am. Yeah. I've got my identification badge on me, but I'm not going to be wearing it until he yeah. comes in. Later. The search for the illegal subletter, Cabria Ahmed, is stepped up. I need to uh, speak to you, please. I'm from Poplar Harker. Can you open the door, please, sir? And what happens when he's finally brought to justice? Earlier, UEFA qualified goalkeeping coach Adio Raji was suspected of illegally subletting his social housing flat. To find out if it was true, Housing Association Charlton Triangle decided to pay him a visit. There you can see a handbag there. Um, girls' pyjamas. Mr Raji's six foot four with no hair at all, um, so there'd be no reason for him to have a hairdryer. 
Actually, when I saw this, I did have to laugh. It was quite clear cut he was subletting to these young ladies because there was nothing in that flat belonging to Mr. Arju. Nothing at all. One of the subtenants made a witness statement saying that they were paying Mr. Raji £800 a month in rent, but the football coach denied everything. One of those um, situations where you scratch your head in disbelief, you think, no, not Mr. Raji. Can't be. But, uh, yes, it was. If he really was committing tenancy fraud, they needed hard evidence. The Royal Borough of Greenwich fraud team was called in, led by investigator Karen Evans. Her first step was to re-interview the subtenant, who was to prove a key witness. She provided Karen with details of the bank account she used to pay rent to Mr Raji. The evidence that we can obtain from, from the banks now is, is um, uh, conclusive, so conclusive, such conclusive evidence. The subtenant had told us that she'd used a certain bank account to pay the money into a, a bank account number. We were obtaining, we obtained copies of both of those bank accounts, which showed the transfer of money from her to him. Bank records showed the subtenants were making rental payments to Mr. Raji of £184 a week. That's nearly £800 a month. That meant once he'd paid his social rent, Mr. Raji was making a clear profit of £330 a month. The profit that, that he'd made for the period that we could prove. Um, amounted to £4,330. Mr Raji continued to vehemently deny he was subletting. Clearly the evidence didn't, didn't back that up um, and that's why I wanted to get him into interview and ask him about um, the situation, showing the documentation that we'd obtained, which, which quite clearly showed the money being paid from the subtenants on a regular basis and him very nicely profiting from the situation. Mr. Raji was invited to attend an interview under caution at Greenwich Council. He came in, uh, he was represented by a solicitor and um, right from the off, uh, offered no comment to any questions that we wanted to ask him. Um, he uh, pr produced a written statement to us, which said, I've always lived there. I don't sublet it. Um, I've never taken in a lodger or a subtenant and he signs that document as a statement of truth. They're here on the 13th of July, 2015. Karen's colleague, fellow fraud investigator Clive Parrish, was also present at the interview. He seemed quite um, affronted that, that we were asking him questions at all. Um, and, and that made him a little different, really, to, to the people that I might normally interview. There was almost an arrogance about him in the way that he, that he said no comment. And for somebody like Mr Raji, uh, who put um, a, a person into his flat and he charged them a rent, a rent far and above what he was actually paying for the flat himself, um, is, is completely wrong. And he was making a profit out of his social housing tenancy. Shock and disbelief yeah. is... You know, because we do, we deal with people like this all the time. It's this, the bottom line is yeah. the greed yeah, is, it is. It's the hurtful thing. And I, I feel sorry for the people that are caught in the middle of it. Charlton Triangle served Mr Raji with a notice to quit and ordered him to hand the keys back. He still refused to leave, saying that this is where he lived, he had nowhere else to go. Um, and uh, his landlord took him to court, civil courts, on a couple of occasions. Um, he was represented and he continued to deny that he'd done anything wrong. Instead, he contacted the subtenants and told them they had to leave. Within a couple of days, he contacted the occupants of the flat. He told them that he'd reported the situation to the police, that they shouldn't be there and that they have to move out immediately. One of the occupants left immediately never to be seen again. The other subtenant, the one who'd given a witness statement against Mr. Raji, was away on holiday, but that didn't stop him from removing her belongings. He came round to this property whilst the uh, lady that was renting from him was on holiday, and he got all of her stuff and he moved it all out. He put all of her belongings and furniture in the storage, and when she came back from her holiday, she opened the door and all her stuff was gone. 
In fact, I believe that she couldn't even get the door open because he'd changed the locks. We couldn't believe that, that, that Mr Raji would behave in that manner. That was quite um, mm. shocking and upsetting and disappointing, to say the least. I think um, the reason why the subtenants were ousted out of the property was so that he could quickly get back in there to make it look like this is where he lives. In March 2016, Mr Raji finally agreed to sign forms giving up possession and return the flat to Charlton Triangle. After about a year since we interviewed him, he finally seemed to come to his senses that this was not going to go away, that he was not going to get away with it. Well, by this time, we had got our solicitors involved. Myself and another colleague turned up at the flat with the solicitor with a consent order to say that he was going to give up his flat and that he would hand the keys in. But he signed the order, so we got back our one-bedroom property that went to somebody deserving of it. But that wasn't the end of the matter. Because of his deception and the overwhelming evidence, Greenwich Council decided to proceed with a criminal prosecution. In December 2016, Mr Raji pleaded guilty to fraud, unlawful subletting and unlawful eviction. I think that Mr Raji realised that, you know, it was bang to rights. <laughs> the evidence was overwhelming. Um, the statements that backed it up uh, were all there. Um, he didn't really have very much movement. If we were going to go to trial, he knew that he'd be in a difficult situation. Um, and I think he realised that he needed to, um, he needed to back down and, and plead and take the rap, basically. After an investigation lasting nearly two years, Mr Raji was given a 12-month jail sentence, suspended for 18 months, and was ordered to pay £4,330 in compensation, the amount he'd made in unlawful profits. Obviously, you know, it takes a lot of time and effort. Um, but the result was the right result at the end of the day, and we were very satisfied with the outcome. An opinion shared by head of fraud at Greenwich Council, Nigel Brown. You could argue, you know, should he go to prison, yes or no? At the end of the day, it costs us all money to put Mr Raji in prison. Therefore, there's no financial gain out of that. I think for him to lose £4,500 and to have that now on his record in the future, uh, that he's been done for uh, tenancy fraud, is a good thing for, for all concerned, other than him, obviously. I know how short we are of social housing. I know how many people are desperate to find somewhere to live, and yet we've still got tenants making their own allocations policies and deciding who they should, you know, be housing. And that's not how it works. That frustrates me, and it satisfies me greatly to know that we've got that property back. Back in the London borough of Tower Hamlets, Shannon and her boyfriend Naeem thought they'd found a place to call home. But a few months after moving in, they discovered they'd been conned. The flat they'd been renting was a social housing property, and the tenant, Cabria Ahmed, was committing fraud by subletting it. With their help, fraud investigator Avril Drummond is trying to trap down her tenant. Hello. Thank you for seeing me again today. Obviously, we're now waiting for your landlord to turn up, OK? So we'll just play it by ear when he gets here. We've got the police on standby, and they're in the locality as well, OK? Eventually, a man turns up, but it's not Mr Ahmed. Avril calls the police in, and he's arrested, questioned, but later released without charge. The next morning, Avril briefs fellow investigator Mike Frost about the previous day's events. We asked him about Mr Ahmed. He said, as a friend, he was helping Mr Ahmed, but he only, he only posed as the landlord. He took the £800 a month and gave it to his friend. He said, I'm not taking any money for myself. That's, that's kind of him, isn't it? The rent Cabria Ahmed was paying to Poplar Harker was just £292 a month. Avril and Mike are more determined than ever to track him down and bring him to justice. They get a tip-off that he's in the area, and then they spot his car. Kibbs? Eh? Kibbs, as in Kibera? Yeah. Possibly. I need to uh, speak to you, please. 
Sorry, I'm from Poplar Harker. It's all... Can you open the door, please, sir? I'm Michael Frost from the Fraud Investigation Team. You can be around. His identity is confirmed. Avril calls the police, and Mr Ahmed, in the hooded coat, is handcuffed and led away for questioning. They're searching his vehicle at the moment, um, which he said was a gift from his mother. So um, we'll wait and see if they uncover any evidence from there. Later, the investigation comes full circle and Mr Ahmed faces his day in court. I feel justified in bringing the case to court. Too many people believe social housing fraud is not a big deal and it doesn't really matter. But now we will bring criminal prosecutions when we deem them necessary. And what happens when he feels the full weight of the law? What do you mean? The housing crisis is no longer confined to densely populated metropolitan areas of the UK. Here in the cathedral city of Peterborough, there are almost 3,000 people on the waiting list. Nearly 400 of those are families in desperate need. Adrian Chapman is the council's director of adult services and communities. About a year ago, we were probably advertising about 40 properties a week that people could apply for. Um, these days, if we get up to double figures a week, we're doing really well. So um, we've got a lot of demand uh, and not enough supply. In 2015 to 2016, the council spent more than a million pounds putting families in temporary accommodation, including B&Bs and even the local travel lodge. We will always accommodate people, albeit temporarily, albeit sometimes in bed and breakfast accommodation, or as we're currently having to use a travel lodge. There is no need for anybody to ha not have a roof over their heads. We've got some nice chicken soup that grandmummy made, and we've got some milk, haven't we? We're struggling in here, because it is difficult just being one room with the three of us. This young family, Joshua, Caroline, and 16-month-old Phoebe, are living in this single room in a hostel on the outskirts of Peterborough. This is all we have, basically. This is our room where we sleep. This is our room where we do everything with Phoebe. Um, there's shared bathrooms, uh, shared kitchen. So it's not, it's not ideal, really. Um, but, I mean, this is what we've got at the minute. We can't really call it our home, but until we find somewhere or the council puts us somewhere, this is, this is all we've got, really. Joshua and Caroline were both in work when their landlord decided to sell up, ironically, so the house could be converted into temporary accommodation units. Suddenly, they were homeless. People think homeless, they just think of someone sort of on the street selling the big issue, and people don't really think that people in B&Bs and hostels are considered as homeless, but this isn't a home, as you can see. It's just one room for the three of us that has been... It's a real struggle at times. The shock of being made homeless whilst bringing up a young child placed a huge stress on this young couple. They're struggling to come to terms with their new circumstances. Over here, we've got some cupboard space. Um, it's got some stuff in it. And then we've got some of our food down here. I think the worst of it is just sort of how cramped it is and how little there is, really. Um, <laughs> like the fact we're having to put most of our stuff under the bed. <laughs> the upheaval has had a huge impact on this young family. Joshua and Caroline have lost their jobs and they now need to get back into employment as soon as possible. But job hunting without a permanent address is difficult. I think getting getting the house is the first step towards getting our lives back on track, really, because that's another thing. Like with the whole temporary accommodation, it, it does kind of put your life on hold a little bit. The longer you're in here, the harder it makes it to get back on track. Since filming, Caroline has managed to get a job in telesales, but they're still living in temporary accommodation. 
there's definitely been there's been a fair share of our dark moments, I'd like to say. But I mean, I think I I do feel quite confident that you know we can only move forward from here. Really, for Phoebe's sake, I just want to get this sorted. With property prices and private rents at an all-time high, more families than ever are in desperate need for social housing, which is why it's so very important housing fraud investigators continue to crack down on those cheating the system. Housing fraud for me is like any other crime. It's, it needs to be treated as a crime and it makes me, in the job I do, extremely angry. I think that they should be kicked out without, without a, a hint of anything if you're caught doing something like that, you don't deserve to be in social housing. End of story. I would say just one unit being misused like that is too much. I think it's despicable that somebody can sit on a piece of property to which they're not entitled. Earlier in Tower Hamlets, Tennessee cheat Cabria Ahmed was arrested for illegally subletting his social housing flat and pocketing thousands of pounds in unlawful profits. Now, more than 12 months since his arrest, Kabria Ahmed is about to face justice. I feel justified in bringing the case to court. Um, I think too many people believe social housing fraud is not a big deal and it doesn't really matter. Um, but I think we've got to start sending that message out that we are taking things seriously. On January the 19th, 2017, 30-year-old Kabria Ahmed pleaded guilty to two counts of fraud, including unlawful subletting, contrary to the Prevention of Social Housing Tenancy Fraud Act. As the first criminal case that Poplar Harker had brought um, for tenancy fraud, so it was quite a big case for us. Mr Ahmed did his best to avoid our cameras, but he couldn't avoid justice. He was given a 12-month jail sentence, suspended for two years, and was ordered to carry out 120 hours unpaid work in the community. I'm really happy, I'm really satisfied with the um, proceedings today. I'm happy with the result we've got um, for Poplar Harker um, and to get in the message out that tenancy fraud's not going to be tolerated. We're going to tackle it head on and we're going to bring pro prosecutions like this um, in the future. After the hearing, as Mr Ahmed made a run for it, not everyone seemed entirely happy with the proceedings. As for Shannon and Naeem, the innocent victims who were tricked into subletting Mr Ahmed's social housing flat, they had no choice but to move out and are now flat hunting again. I really miss this place. We got engaged there. He proposed to be there on Christmas Day. Mm. And we've got yeah. so many memories in this place. There are friends coming around, my family coming here. Yeah, it was. It's, it's horrible, it's all just been taken away. Like, the house that we've made a home, built up, just gone, everything gone. And now we're back to square one. Tenancy fraud is never a victimless crime. There's always a financial cost and a very human cost to pay. But thanks to the tireless work of housing fraud investigators across the UK, those who are cheating the system are being tracked down and their properties are being reclaimed and relet. Wednesday morning here on BBC One with Helen.